with me during that time. At this time, I'm going to invite Jesse Moldenauer up front to read our scripture passage for us. And I'm going to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah, chapter 1. How many of you are rejoicing that we're actually going to look at the book of Jonah today, the first chapter? It's been about two months of, of leading up to this, so we're finally getting into it. The book of Jonah, chapter 1. I'm going to have Jesse read verses 1 through 16. 1 through 16 of chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account the evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men know that he was fleeing from the presence of the, of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, we, What shall we do? do to you that the sea may quiet down for us for the sea grew more and more tempestuous he said to them pick me up and hurl me into the sea then the sea will quiet down for you for I know it is because of me that this great tempest had come upon you nevertheless the men rode hard to get back to dry land but they could not for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them therefore they called out to the Lord O Lord let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Thank you, Jesse. At this time, I'm going to invite you to stand with me one more time, and I'm going to pray briefly, and then we will dig in. Would you pray with me? Dear Father, we are grateful that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us in your word. Dear Father, today as we look at this chapter, as we look at Jonah chapter 1, we pray that you would be glorified. Lord, we pray that we would behold Christ and that we would be changed. We love you, Lord. We praise you for this time. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may go ahead and have a seat. Over the course of the last number of weeks, we've been talking about how all of Scripture points to Christ. That's according to Christ himself. All of Scripture points to Christ. So when we come to the book of Jonah and we look at the first chapter, it would help us as we think about how does this passage point us to Christ? How does this first chapter point to Christ? Christ. It helps us to ask these three questions, and these are in your notes. The first question is this. What does this text reveal to us about God? What does this text reveal to us about God? Pretty simple question, right? What does this text reveal to us about God? The second question is this. How does Christ ultimately demonstrate God's character to us. 
Now, some of you might be saying, how did you get to that? Well, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says that Christ is the exact imprint or the exact manifestation of God's nature. He says, in the, in the former days, God spoke to us through the prophets, but in these days, God has spoken us, to us through his Son. He's the exact representation of God's nature. So it's good for us as we look at Jonah to ask this question, how does Christ demonstrate God's character to us? Make sense? Everyone with me so far? Nod your heads, even if you're not, okay? The third question is this. What do we see in this text about the human condition? What do we see in this text about the human condition? In other words, we're saying, what is it about the characters in this story that we can relate with, that we see in our own hearts, that show us our need for Christ, our need for the gospel? What do we see in this text about the human condition? This is the sin problem that all of us can relate with, if we're honest, right? So the series title of this series in Jonah is called this. It's called this. It's called Jonah and the Sovereign Saving Mercy of God. That's the overall theme that we're going to keep seeing Sunday after Sunday, we're probably going to spend four Sundays, four more Sundays in the book, one in each chapter, probably. You know better than to listen to me, though, right, when I say that? Um, when I tell you what's coming the next number of weeks, you know better than to trust that. Um, we do our best, right? But we're not, we're not just going to try to rush through this. We're going to try to see what does the Lord have to say to us. And if it's enough for a given Sunday, then we'll take more time, Okay. I want to make sure that you're aware of that, that that's the overall theme here. Jonah and the sovereign, saving mercy of God. That's what we're going to see. The message title for today is this. Jonah runs and God saves. Jonah runs and God saves. The summary statement for today, what I really want you to leave here with today, if you forget everything else except for Bailey's talk, if you forget everything else from what I say, I want you to catch this, because I want to make sure you remember what Bailey said too. I want you to remember this. God works mightily. God works mightily. Now listen to this. Even through his prophet's disobedience. God works mightily, even through his prophet's disobedience. That's not going to be up on the screen, but I have to add that in here because that is very clearly a part of this first chapter. We're going to see Jonah's disobedience very, very clearly, right? So God works mightily, even through Jonah's disobedience, even through his prophet's disobedience, to do what? To save. God works mightily mightily to save. Look with me at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying this. First of all, I want us to think about Jonah just for a moment. Jonah, we see very clearly here, is the son of Amittai. We don't know who Amittai is. We just know that he's his son, right? And then we're going to just believe that it really doesn't matter who Amittai is, except that that's just how they identified themselves, right, in those days. I'm the son of Jim. Jim is my dad. Um, Jonah was the son of Amittai. Then we're going to see, and we saw this last week, that he was the prophet to the northern kingdom. Remember last week, we talked just, not to, not to bore you with details, but remember we talked about how Saul was the first king of Judah, right, of Israel. Then we have David, the second king. Then we have Solomon, David's son, right, who builds the temple, right, in Jerusalem. Then what happens? Then we have King Rehoboam, and under Rehoboam, the kingdom is split. So we've got Rehoboam in the southern kingdom that's called Judah from then on. The northern kingdom is the northern ten tribes that's called Israel, 
All right, it's important for us to remember that because Jonah was a prophet to the northern kingdom, all right, whose capital was Samaria. Okay, everybody with me? I realize that's a little bit of detail. Maybe you don't really care that much about, but it's going to be significant in this story. In the book of 2 Kings, how many of you knew this, that the Bible speaks other than the New Testament? We do see Jesus talking about Jonah, but there's another place in the Old Testament where Jonah is talked about. 2 Kings chapter 14, verses 23 through 25 tell us just a little bit more about this prophet. Because otherwise, what else do we know about him? So we got to go to this text. It's going to be up on the screen here for you, I believe. It says this, in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. Okay, this is the second king Jeroboam, not the first one, it's the second one. Okay, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. That was the first Jeroboam, okay? the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. Now listen to this. Listen to how this king is remembered, other than the fact that he was a bad king. He was an evil king. Listen to how he's remembered. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah. There it is. Ding, ding, ding. Right? There we see him. The Lord had spoken through Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who is from Gath, Heifer. I, I'm not sure if that's exactly how you say those things. It might be more like Gath, Heifer or something like that. I don't know how you pronounce those words for sure, but I'm going to go with Gath, Heifer. Okay, so we see here that Jonah is the son of Amittai, same Jonah we're talking about in Jonah chapter 1, right? We also see here that 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 he had prophesied that Israel's borders would be extended. Did you see that? You see that in this text? This is really, really important for us to see. Jonah had had some prophetic success. Do you see that? Jonah was probably esteemed by the people of Israel, because he had prophesied good for Israel, and then what had happened? It happened. Okay, so Jonah is probably respected. He's probably esteemed. He's probably even a little bit admired for his role as a prophet to the northern kingdom. All right? Jonah... This is what I take from this. Jonah is probably pretty comfortable with his calling. He's probably pretty comfortable. Who wouldn't be? Right? If we put ourselves in his shoes, pff, yeah, I prophesied that the kingdom would, uh, that the kingdom would extend, and, and sure enough it did, and we're good. Right? I'm going to go down in history as the, the good prophet to the northern kingdom. Right? Wrong. Look with me at verse 2. This is what the Lord said to him. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up against me. The Lord tells him to go to Nineveh, right? The capital city of Assyria. We talked about that last week. Assyria was this kingdom, this major superpower that had been temporarily weakened through some plagues and weak leadership, right? But they were still oppressing the Israelites. They had oppressed the Israelites in the past. And if we look at Israel's history, we're going to see that Israel goes to captivity into Assyria in the year 722 B.C. Really about 40 years later, a generation later, that's what's going to happen. We don't know if Jonah knew this at the time or not, Okay. But this is who God is calling him to go to. The only prophet recorded in Scripture that's commanded to go to another country and prophesy. Right? The only one that we have in Scripture. 
So Nineveh, if you remember, was a great city. It was large and powerful. It's the capital city, right? An important city. We also see here that God says that the evil, its evil had risen up to him, had come up to him. We saw this last week. It was an evil empire. The whole empire of Assyria was evil, right? We talked about how brutal they were, how violent they were. We talked about the things that they did to their prisoners that were unspeakable. I couldn't even say them, right? Remember that? They were definitely a superpower to be reckon with. And that's who God is calling Jonah to go and prophesy to. Remember comfortable Jonah, who had had some ministry success, prophetic success. Get out of your comfort zone. Go to Nineveh. Verse 3. But it's never good in Scripture. When the Lord tells you to do something, and the next word is but. Never a good sign. Verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah went to, he rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now we've got a map here I wanted to make sure that I showed you. These pictures here real quickly. You're going to see, here is the city of Joppa. That's where he's going to board the ship to Tarshish. Tarshish. Tarshish is not on this map, but it's going to be, can, you, can everybody see where I'm pointing? I got a pointer. Actually, there were two people who, well, one, one couple gave me a pointer this week. I was really excited about that. And then another guy this morning said, I've got two pointers for you. Um, so we've got three pointers, if anyone needs one. Um, so, whoop, there it is. So that's where Tarshish is. We're going to see that a little better now. Here's the kingdom of Assyria, right? Here's Nineveh. Everyone over here, can you see where I'm pointing? There's Nineveh. Can you see that? Assyria. They're pressing on Israel. Pressing, pressing. Right? Um, let's look at the next map. So Jonah is called to go to Nineveh, which is over here. Where does he go? He wants to go to Tarshish, which is the other end of the world. And if you were here in church last Sunday, you saw that. You couldn't get further away. This was the end of the known world. You could not get further away from where God had called you to if you were Jonah. This was straight up disobedience. There's no way to sugarcoat it. That's what it was. Some scholars believe that Jonah actually resigned his position at the moment he headed for Joppa to board that ship. That makes sense, doesn't it? How can you speak the words of the Lord when you're running away from him? Good question. How can you? You can't. Not very effectively, right? But before we shake our finger at Jonah and think, shame, 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 Jonah, everybody knows your name, right? Did you guys do that when you were kids? No? Was I the only one? Was that an Iowa thing? Maybe. Shame, 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 Jonah. Before we think that, like Jonah, we appreciate the comfort in our lives too, don't we? How many of us, I mean, raise your hand. I like sitting on the couch on Friday night watching Netflix. Uh, I like that, right? Um, how many of us like our comfortable lives? And how would we respond Put ourselves in Jonah's shoes just for a minute. This isn't the point of this first chapter, but it's, it's interesting to do. How would you respond if, call, if God called you to the center of the Taliban to go and minister to them, prophesy to them? Or what if he called you to Nigeria and you were told by the Lord to prophesy to the Boko Haram, who are known for all the beheadings and stuff like that? Well, I think the Taliban is too. Um, or maybe, or maybe you're called to go not too far from Bailey to the drug cartel in Colombia. How much fun would that be? Um, or maybe you're called to go to North Korea and the communists there. 
what would your response be? So you kind of, when you're, when you're doing your shame, 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 it, it kind of cuts that short, doesn't it? Look with me at verse 3. He says, Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah, you have got to be kidding me. Can you actually succeed in doing that? I mean, Jonah, let's, let's, I mean, he must have flunked that class in theology because he knows the, Jonah knows the scriptures. That's the astounding thing. Jonah knows that Psalm 139 says this. I think it's going to be up on the screen. Psalm 139, is that there? There we go. It says this, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? You, that's the same words that it says in Jonah. Fleed from the presence of the Lord. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of morning and dwell in the uttermost of the sea, the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Can you escape the presence of the Lord? And all God's people said, no, no. But sometimes maybe we would like to, right? Jonah cannot escape the presence of the Lord. And then it's interesting because it says this, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He went down. Down. We're going to see that phrase like three or four different times in this text. And the author of Jonah, who probably was Jonah many years later, after he truly had come to repentance, had truly humbled himself and realized, i gotta, I got to share this message under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right? <clears throat> um, in this text, it says at least three times that he went down. And this was to picture, this was to help us to picture the downward spiral of sin. The downward spiral. We're meant to see this picture in this text. The end of verse 3. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Verse 4, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Verse 4, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. What do you think of when you think about the Lord hurling this wind upon the sea, the storm upon the sea? What do you think of about the Lord's character? He's sovereign. The Lord is in control. The Lord is clearly the one who is doing this. The Lord is in control of all of this. This is such a good reminder for us, isn't it? The Lord is always in control. Always in control. No matter what is going on in our lives, He is sovereign over it all. Church, trailhead, did you hear me? This will change the way we live our lives if we believe the Lord is truly sovereign over it all. We don't understand it right, but it's what Scripture teaches. And it is so good for us to believe it. Even though it's hard for us to understand, even though it's hard for us to grasp, somehow the Lord is using this for His glory and for our good. We don't know. We don't understand it so many times. But he's a good, good father. We just got done singing about that. He will bring into our lives what's best for us. That's what Jonah is communicating in this text. The Lord is sovereign over all of this. Look with me at verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down, there it is again, gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. Oh, we got a lot to talk about in this verse. A lot. Verse 5, now the, the, the mariners or the sailors, I like to use the word sailors, 
they come into the story. And we see here that they're pagan sailors. They worship many gods. Each of them was crying out to his God. They were different, different gods that they were crying out to. Obviously, obviously, this is an effective visit. They're crying out to their gods, and it's not working. Why isn't it working? Because there's one true God. There is one true God. You see in this text that they hurled their cargo into the sea. I never thought about that. I never really thought about what it meant that they were hurling their cargo into the sea. If you paid attention, you see that the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. This is very, very incredible writing, first of all. The second thing is, these prophets, not these prophets, these pagan sailors were giving up hope of profit. In other words, this was a desperate, desperate situation, and they just wanted to live. Do you hear what I'm saying? They didn't care anymore about the cargo, which is why they went to Tarshish in the first place, right? When you're a sailor, that's how you make money, by finishing your delivery. You get the load there, right? Any of you who are truckers, I know we maybe don't have any sailors here, but if you're a trucker, right? Okay, maybe that wasn't funny. I thought it was funny. Um... We can't be sailors except for on the lake back here, right? But, okay. So they gave up their hope of profit, right? By hurling their, it just shows they're desperate, these sailors are. They're desperate to live. But it says, but Jonah had gone down into the heart of the ship. In the inner part of the ship, he laid down and he was asleep. And when you get to this part of the text, you ask, Jonah, how in the world could you be sleeping at a time like this? Did any of you think that that might be a good question? How can he be sleeping at a time like this? You know what I think? It was from sheer exhaustion. It is exhausting, isn't it, to run from the Lord? To try to run from the Lord. It's exhausting. It can't be done in the first place, but even to try is going to wear a person out. So Jonah is fast asleep. And the bottom line is he's not helping in this situation. He's not. Look with me at verse 6. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise! Just like the Lord had told him to arise and go to Nineveh, this captain, this pagan captain, this pagan sailor is telling him, arise and cry out to your God. Perhaps he can help us. We don't know your God, but maybe he could help us. That's what this captain is saying. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Little did he know what was coming, right? Little did he know. <clears throat> Verse 7. They said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. Once again, once again, we see God's sovereignty over the lots. It says, They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Did you see that? God's sovereignty is clearly being portrayed, clearly being demonstrated in this text. He's control of it all. Now, there was a guy this past week who said to me, how did they cast the lots? Well, what did that actually look like? And in fact, we talked about it for quite a while, and we finally had to come to the realization that we don't know. Now, if you watch the VeggieTales hit movie, Jonah, I'm serious, good I mean, this is incredible stuff. If you watch the movie Veggie Tales, it came out in 2003, um, which was right around the time that Marn was born. So I watched it like 45 times. And, and I think they're on to something here because they portrayed this casting of lots being a game of go fish. And I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Um, they played a game of go fish, and Jonah was the loser. And so, the lot fell on Jonah. 
Now, I want you to think about this. Jonah could have come clean right away. He could have. He could have just said right away, I know it's my fault. It's, I, I know I, I, I'm trying to run from God. I can't do it. He's, he's, he's got me. And, right? He could have done that. It's because of my sin. No, he didn't do that. Right? So they cast lots. The lot falls on him. It seems that Jonah wasn't very eager to confess his sin. And there are two observations that I want to make with you right now. The first one is that our sin is a way of finding us out. Not always. Praise the Lord for his mercy and grace, right? But our sin has a way of finding us out. The second thing is this. Our sin does not occur in a vacuum. In other words, our sin affects the people that are around us. We oftentimes don't think it does, but it does. And that's what we see in this situation. Jonah's sin is affecting this whole ship. All these sailors, we don't know how many of them there were. It's affecting all these people. <clears throat> Look with me at verse 8. Verse 8, Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And I think that these sailors really might be asking this. We want, to mo we want to know more about this God of the sea. Tell us some more. We, we want to know more about this God, the one who is causing this storm. Look with me at verse 9. He, he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah says, I fear Yahweh. I fear Jehovah. They're using the covenant name. They're using the name of Israel's covenant God. This is how God had made himself known to Moses at the burning bush. I am Jehovah. The covenant name of Israel's God. He was the one who made the sea and dry land, Jonah says, the creator. Look with me at verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said, And what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. The sailors, these sailors are exceedingly afraid. And they say, What is it you have done? Proverbs 1 verse 7 says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The author of the book Gospel that the men have been going through here recently, J.D. Greer, said this. <coughs> he said this, True worship begins with fear. True worship begins with fear. It doesn't end there, but that's where it starts. And I think that's what's happening here. They, they are fearing this God of the sea. Look with me at verse 11. Then they said, And what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. The sea grew more and more tempestuous. Verse 12, Jonah said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Just like they hurled their cargo. Just like the Lord hurled the storm on the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Jonah's response here is, it's my fault. Throw me in. And a good question at this point as we're reading through this text is, how did Jonah know? How did Jonah know that if the sailors threw him in, that the sea would stop its raging? You know what I believe? Does anyone want to know what I believe? <laughs> that occurred to me as I said, do you, do you know? What I believe is that God told him. God told him. Which is pretty exceptional as he is running away from the Lord. 
So God speaks to him again and says, this is what you're to tell these sailors. I think that now I'm, I realize that I'm speculating a bit. I can't prove that with scripture. Okay. But God might have told him. Verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. So these men, do you see this? These men don't want to do it. Why do they not want to do it? Because they fear Jonah's God. They fear Jonah's God, and they do not want to be guilty of taking innocent blood. Well, not innocent. He's not innocent. They don't want to be, taking, they don't want to be guilty of taking a man's life. Right? If there's any way to avoid it. Um, and so they're rowing. You can almost kind of picture this. And it's getting them nowhere. Right? Verse 14. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord. And it's important to see here that they now are using the covenant name of God, Jehovah. O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. What are they saying there? Did you hear that? Let me read it again. O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. Okay, the first part, they, they don't want to be guilty of taking Jonah's life, right? But then look at the second part. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. What do you hear there that I've been talking about? Say it a little louder. God's sovereignty, right? The Lord is accomplishing his purposes. Do you see it? You, Lord, have done as it pleased you. These pagan sailors are speaking the truth about God. God is sovereign over all of this. Verse 15. So they picked up Jonah and hurled. There's that word again. Does it make anyone want to hurl? Hopefully not. Okay. Sorry. So they picked up Jonah. If you were on the ship, you'd probably want to hurl, right? <laughs> um, not just the cargo. Okay. Um, they picked up Jonah, sorry about that. They picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. They throw him in, the sea ceases to rage. Consider this. Consider this. The sacrifice of Jonah for these pagan sailors points to the sacrifice of Christ for us. Do I need to say that again? Because that, I mean, that is like really, really good stuff. I, I, it's not from me. It's a, I, I, there are other people who say this about this text. This is a powerful statement. The sacrifice of Jonah for these pagan sailors points us to the sacrifice of Christ for us. That's the good news of the gospel. Verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The sailor's response is to fear the Lord exceedingly. They offered sacrifices to this covenant God of Israel, Yahweh. They made vows to him. They are saved, not only physically, but spiritually. Truly, God works mightily to save, even through his prophet's disobedience. Just a couple concluding thoughts. Three. As we conclude, we need to go back to the opening questions. You remember the opening questions, and maybe by now you're like, "Oh, I don't even, I don't even need to, <laughs> you don't even need to tell me, Pastor Mark, because these things are clear." I, I think they probably are, but I'm going to go over them anyway. The first one is this: What does this text reveal to us about God? It reveals to us that He is merciful, He is compassionate to the sailors, He acts mightily to save them, even though Jonah was disobedient. I already just said that, but I wanted to 
say it again. The second question is this. How does Christ ultimately demonstrate God's character to us? And again, you, you're going to know the punchline before I even get there, right? God ultimately demonstrates his mercy and compassion in Christ. God ultimately, let me say that again, God ultimately demonstrates his mercy and compassion in Christ and his wrath-bearing death on the cross for sinners. What does this text tell us about the human condition? Like the pagan sailors, we too, before Christ, right? Before trusting in Christ, we too are in need of God's mercy and compassion to save us from our sin. And if you are here today and you are not trusting Christ for your Savior, I'm not saying, did you pray a prayer once? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you are not currently trusting Christ today, I'm imploring you, even as the Apostle Paul said, I implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Like these pagan sailors were. Be reconciled to God today. Do you see what Christ did for you on the cross? His blood was shed for you. His body was broken for you. Christ was the perfect sacrifice, the wrath-bearing sacrifice, the wrath that we deserve because of our sin. God laid on his son, Christ, kneeling him to the cross. I implore you today, trust in Christ. And for those of us who are trusting Christ today, trust him more. Trust him more. Behold the God that we see in Jonah chapter 1. Behold how we see Christ in this first chapter. And be changed. Say with the man who said to Christ, we do believe, help us overcome our unbelief. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me now? Dear Father, we are again so grateful that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us through your word. Dear Father, we're grateful that even in this first chapter of Jonah, we are pointed to Christ in some really pretty powerful, pretty tangible ways. Lord, we praise you that it was your will that pagan sailors would come to you, to come to faith in you. Even through Jonah's disobedience, that's astounding. It's staggering to think about your sovereign will accomplishing this. So Lord, I, I pray that for those who are here today that are maybe not trusting you, that today would be the day of salvation. That today would be the day that they would say, I, I repent of my sins, I turn to you, Lord, in faith. I trust you. I have no other hope. Dear Father, I pray that it would be the day. And Lord, for those of us who are trusting you, I pray that we would trust you more. Lord, that, it, that, that we would be reminded again of your sovereignty and, and that you, even, you work even in what appears to be evil to accomplish your good will, your good purposes. Lord, we do believe you. We do trust you. We pray that we would trust you more. Dear Father, would you continue to sink this word deeply in, in our hearts as we leave this place this morning. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Christ, in the love of God the Father, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with you all as you leave this place. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you for being here this morning. God bless you as you go. You're dismissed.